No tears, no tears, no tears up there, no tears in heaven will be known. Our song before the lesson will be, or after the lesson will be, Anywhere with Jesus, number 414. y'all bring up that first picture so if it comes up here in a moment that's a picture i took ran by the house real quick before i headed over here and walked out and took this picture of one of my hives so right now it's really hot so they're all hanging out on the front porch because they don't have air conditioning on the inside although they can make their own air conditioning but they hang out on the front porch and i want to take a picture of this hive because i have about nine hives behind my house and so it's something I enjoy hanging out with bees. I like to say sometimes I'm stung less by bees than people. And so I enjoy hanging out and spending time with them. But what can happen is sometimes you can get really comfortable being around them. And so if you're around your bees and if, you, if you're into them a lot, they get used to your pheromones. And so they can be pretty chill around you depending on what time of day you go in there, especially if you go during the middle of the day when it's mostly the young bees. It's a little worse at the end of the day if the forager bees are all home, then they get a little grumpier. But what can happen is you get used to being around them and you're, it's, it's really hot here. So I don't put on, I don't have a full suit, I just have an upper vest and I have a little hood I can wear. I don't like to put that whole thing on unless I have to. Because it's hot in Alabama and I figure there's a greater likelihood of dying of heat stroke than dying of bee stings. And so sometimes I'm like, mm, I'm going to go bee sting. And so I was recently just, a lot of times I come in at the end of the day and I have just a few minutes if I need to do something. And so I thought, you know, I've got, I just bought some new frames. I've got a top box in one of the hives I didn't have enough frames for. When I added the box, I need to fill that out so that they can comb it out and put all comb out means is that they add the wax and make the cells so that they can put food in it and so forth. I, I, I'll, it'll just take a second. I'll just pop that lid, I'll stick three frames in, and I'll go to the house. Because the last few times I'd been in there, they were chill, no big deal. I cracked that lid, and I got six things from here up in about seven and a half seconds. And so I say that to say this, if you keep bees, what do you have to expect? You're going to get stung. It goes with the territory. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, The devil is a roaring lion seeking to devour us. Guess what happens if you play with a lion? You just might be on the menu. I say that to say this, I'm afraid as Christians we play with dangerous things too much. We play around with the devil too much. We play around with sin too much. We play around with temptation too much. We get comfortable, we say, I can handle it. I can get close, but I won't go over the edge. I can watch this, but I won't start thinking it. I can listen to it, but it won't influence my actions. And if you get too comfortable with something that has a stinger or teeth, you may pay for it. Spiritually, if we get too comfortable with things that are not of God, but rather are of the roaring lion, then it just may devour us. So as we get ready to sing this invitation song, I want each of us to evaluate ourselves. Have I gotten too comfortable with some things? Have I gotten too comfortable with putting off becoming a Christian? My guess is there's somebody here tonight that knows, they believe Jesus is the Son of God, they know they should be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins based on that faith. It's like, I've got time, I'm young, I'm... You're playing with fire. You're playing with something a lot worse than a hive of bees. For those of us who are Christians, are there some things in our lives that ought not to be there? some influences that we're allowing to get a little too close to us. If we can help you, if we can pray with you, if we can encourage you, won't you come as we stand and sing? Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go Anywhere He leads
leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over dearest ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for uh, this devotional time. God, we ask you to please just uh, help us be able to uh, take what was said and to be able to apply it and use it. Uh, please just be with us as we go throughout our day. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, everybody, it's time for us to go ahead and, uh, and begin. I want to give uh, uh, Brother uh, Kurt Brothers uh, uh, as much time as possible. I'd hate to limit uh, him. Um, as I said before, uh, you guys are in for a special treat. Uh, Brother Kurt, uh, he is, a, as I said, he is a great uh, friend and mentor uh, to, to many, many people, including myself, and, 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 a, and a lot of us, including myself, consider him a friend. Uh, and so I think you guys, you guys are really going to be in for a treat uh, this evening. Uh, but um, if, for those who don't know, uh, Brother Kurt, uh, he grew up in Elizabethtown, uh, Kentucky. Uh, he's married to uh, uh, Cindy uh, for 35 years. Um, he has two daughters, Kate and Hannah. Uh, he has his bachelor's in uh, MDiv uh, from Lipscomb, uh, master's of New Testament from Free Hardeman, PhD from Southern Baptist Theological uh, uh, seminar in Louisville. Uh, he did full-time work for 23 years in Kentucky, Mississippi, Tennessee. Uh, I mean, uh, Brother Kirk has, has been all over. He, he does a lot of fantastic work. Uh, he d- does mission work in Latin America. Uh, he does training camps and teaching the, uh, uh, at the Bible School of Americas in Panama. Uh, he, is, he is a fantastic, and I, as I said, he's a mentor to many, uh, many people. Uh, he taught eight years at Free Hardeman. Uh, and he is currently in his sixth year as the president and professor at Heritage Christian uh, University. Uh, and he began there in 2018. And so I won't uh, just uh, say uh, any more about him. Uh, I'll let him, uh, I don't want to take too much of his time as well. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and give the floor over to Brother Kurt. Uh, and uh, I think we're all going to be blessed. former students at least that I've talked to, talked to tonight. One of the things I've enjoyed even at uh, my work at Heritage is I travel around. I run into a lot of my students from Freed Hardeman and now I've started running into students that I've taught at both of the schools. And I literally have taught a number of students that I had at Freed Hardeman who are now students with us at Heritage Christian. So I'm grateful to him for his kindness and his introduction and uh, my brother-in-law is one of my, I guess, my second best friend in the world because my wife is number one, and I know they're good friends, and uh, I'm just glad to be with you. regret my wife. We, I have two daughters. One lives in Gallatin, works in Nashville. Another one, I have a special needs daughter that lives at home with us, but Cindy and Katie can't be here tonight because they're actually at her parents'. Uh, in fact, I told him probably eating supper uh, with his friend Joey as we speak. And so I'm grateful that I can be with you. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Judges, but I'd like to start off in Deuteronomy chapter 34. Now, periodically, I'm going to look over my shoulder to make sure that the slides are changing for us because I want to get the text in front of us. In some of this, I've got some maps. I want you to be kind of be able to see what's happening on a map to think about distances and directions and those kinds of things. So I apologize in advance for looking over my shoulder. But if we look in Deuteronomy chapter 34... It says, since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And that's a, a, a key expression. It's a, it's a way, we know from Exodus chapter 33 that no one can look on the face of God and live. That no one can handle the full brunt of His glory. So when it says face to face, Literally, Exodus 33 talks about him speaking face-to-face like to a friend, and then a few verses later says, you can't fully look at me. So how do I reconcile those? Well, I can't literally, with my human eyes, handle the full presence of God. When he says God spoke to him face-to-face, it is a symbolic way of describing the closeness of their relationship. Okay, They are tight. I've often said my favorite characters, other than the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are Moses in the Old Testament and John the Apostle in the New Testament because they kind of look like God's best friends. In the Old Testament, Moses had a really, really unique relationship with God. In the New Testament, John the Apostle seems to have had a really, really unique relationship with Jesus. I want you to think about that as we move forward and eventually are going to skip from Deuteronomy over to the book of Judges. And so if you want to park in your Bibles... You can get to Judges chapter 17 and 18. 
So did anybody here grow up on comic books? I'm trying to see who are my cultured people are in the room. Okay, so I've got a few that will confess it. Some are, doctor over here says he's a little wishy-washy. He's not sure Brother Baggett wants to own up to it. You'll, you'll confess it, all right? So I grew up in a comic book world. In fact, the, the picture on the screen, some of the comics back when I was a kid that my mom had in the attic. So I took a picture of them one day. And uh, I remember when I was a kid, the Incredible Hulk television show that with Lou Ferrigno that came out. When I got home in the afternoons, I remember there was a Spider-Man animated show. On Saturday mornings, you had Batman and Robin, a world of superheroes. It's actually interesting. I don't know if y'all can see, but over on the left-hand side, there are four comic books on there. I don't know if you can see over here, right there. That one on the Hulk actually talks about Doc Samson, which is a superhero character that is a little bit of play off of Samson in the Bible. He literally had long hair and superhuman strength and hung out with the Hulk. I didn't realize that until I was looking at that uh, right before heading over here. The reason I want you to think about that is we, in our culture down through the years, we've tended to try to find some make-believe superhero and that gives some folks something to believe in, some just do it for fun and for a pastime. If you were to talk to an Israelite in the first century, they're heroes, not comic book heroes, not make-believe, but they're real, they're real heroes. If you wanted to convince a Jewish audience in the first century, at the time of Jesus, of something you had to say, then all you had to do was quote one of these three people. If you quoted Moses, you quoted Abraham, or you quoted David, they would listen to what you had to say because you are quoting their idols. And now idols, I'm not talking about idols in the way we're talking about tonight. I'm talking about in the sense of people they look up to and they respect. They were their national, real life, not made up, real life superheroes. I want you to hang on to that. Because as we spend some time in the book of Judges, the book of Judges is largely a book about people struggling to find a hero. As we wrestle with, you've been dealing with various idols this summer. Things we bow down to instead of bowing down to God. What I want to do tonight is pull all of that together and wrestle with what does it look like when a people don't bow down to God. We're going to spend some time in the book of Judges. So in just a moment, we'll look at Judges chapter 17. But the key verse in the book of Judges is Judges chapter 21, verse 25. You have almost the same phrase twice. You also have the expression, uh, there was no king in Israel that shows up multiple times. It's either four or five times in the book, and they're all from chapter 17 onward. The theme of the book is there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. There are two problems presented there. Over and over, at the end of the book, in the darkest portion of the book, they keep saying, in fact, it's like, it's like a stopping mark, and we'll see that tonight. It's, it's, it's like a mile marker. That's probably a better way to put it. You think back going down the road, mile marker one, mile marker two, they have these mile markers as they're telling at the end of the book of Judges, as they're trying to describe how bad it was, they stop and put a, put a mile marker. And that mile marker is there was no king. There was no king. They had a problem of a lack of spiritual leadership. Now, a king does not guarantee they will have spiritual leadership, does it? Did Israel ever have kings? This is, yes, this, this is, I'm asleep, don't bother me. All right, so, did they, they had kings, right? Were they all good? Okay, so the problem was not so much just that they didn't have a king, because a king was no guarantee. What they didn't have was spiritual leadership. And so because they didn't have spiritual leadership, what then was the other problem in this phrase? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You see, there's two problems. There's a leadership problem, and a basis of morality problem. And that undergirds the entire book of Judges. So if we're to look at what's happening in this book, 
I kind of break it into a simple three-part outline. I find with any book in the Bible, if you can have a theme verse that summarizes the book, a theme phrase that summarizes the book, and a simple outline that you can stick in your head, then you can use that book easily the rest of your life. Or at least you've got an entry point. You know what it's about, you know how it breaks down. So as I look at it, the first three chapters are really about the whole issue of, first of all, it starts well. The first about 16 verses talk about their successes. But then it goes downhill quickly until you get to the end of the book, you're literally at the bottom of the drain. Okay, so they start way up here, and then you've got this funnel downward going on all the way through the book of Judges. So at the begin from the beginning, then through about verse 6 of chapter 3, you are introduced, or we are introduced, to the cycle of sin. See, turn this in the right direction. Y'all may have to advance it for me. So in the cycle of sin, what happens is they rebel against God. God rebukes them by raising up a nation around them, allowing their enemies to defeat them. They then many times repent. Actually, the book, they don't even always repent. Sometimes they'll repent and reach out to God. Sometimes they just reach out to God. But they will turn to God in some way, and then God will raise up a judge and restore them to their freedom. So that's what's happening. I think I must have killed this. So in the book, that's what's happening. That's the first three chapters. It kind of introduces us to the cycle of sin. Then, really starting around verse 7 of chapter 3 and going through chapter 16, you have the judgments and the judges. You want me to just talk and you all kind of follow as best you can? Do what? Okay. I'm really good at breaking things. So, the second section deals with the judgments and the judges. In other words, they overview, here's the cycle of sin, chapters 2 and the beginning of 3, and then they give you examples. So really, all those stories of the judges, anywhere from 13 to 15, depending on how you describe what a judge is, deciding some of these, they argue over whether they're a judge or not. But you have this cycle. Why do you have all these judges? Because those are all cycles. You have to have a new judge every time they start a new cycle. So when you have rebellion, rebuke, repentance, and restoration, there's a, there's a judge mixed in that all the way through. And so that happens through verse 16, and they get to one of, if not the worst judges, which is Samson. Then you have the end of the book where you're, you're, you're circling the drain with Samson, but in the last two stories, chapter 17 through the end of the book, you're, you're going down the drain. It is showing a country going down down the drain. And so it's kind of like the author of the book said, hmm, let me pick out the two best examples of how bad things got. I know what we'll do. We'll talk about Micah and Dan fighting over the idols in his house, and we'll tell the story about the concubine and the civil war. And so that's what he does. He ends the book. He goes from Samson who really, I think he ends up in Hebrews 11 in the Faith Hall of Fame because he ended well. Not because he, had, he did such an amazing job as a judge, because most of what he did was not following God's law. He just ended really well. And then that's followed up with this story of idolatry and immorality. And so the book of Judges is what it, it's about what it looks like when a nation walks away from God. Some books in the Bible, some stories in the Bible, show us what it looks like to live like God. Some books show us what it looks like not to live like God. So if you pick up the book of Judges, and your goal in the book of Judges is to look for a bunch of role models, you're not going to find many. There are some there. Caleb is a role model. There are some there, usually the earlier ones. But by and large, it's showing us what happens when there's no spiritual leadership and everyone did, does what is right in their own eyes, not what is right in God's eyes. So with that in mind, let's kind of walk through the story in Judges chapters 17 and 18. What I see 
as you think about this concept of a hero, I want you to think about a nation that desperately needs a spiritual hero. They started out with one. One of my favorite stories to tell is the story of Caleb from chapter 1. I mean, he, he was a hero. He was literally a living legend. But once you get past the, his story and he's giving some land and some water rights to his daughter, Oxa, who married his nephew. Once you get past that and the conquering of Debir, the book drops off a cliff. And they can't seem to find consistent spiritual leadership. They can't find a hero. So as we look at what's going on in Judges chapter 17, I'll try not to look over my shoulder so much. So if it doesn't match what I'm talking about, just look real puzzled or like, what? And I'll look over my shoulder and try to find it. In Judges chapter 17, verse 1, it says, There was a man in the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. So if we were to look at a map, the bottom right-hand corner, so if you want to kind of think of the layout of ancient Israel, over here on the left-hand side, you've got the Mediterranean Sea. Down here in the bottom right-hand corner, you've got the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea. You go straight north, Okay, from the top of the Dead Sea, about 66 miles, and you run into the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. And then on a map, you're going to have this squiggly line that runs from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. That's the Jordan River. And the Jordan River is actually a couple of hundred miles long. It's just smashed into a 66-mile space, so it just kind of does this all the way down. And so if you can think about Israel that way, it helps you to lay it out. You've got bodies of water. You've got two seas, two lakes, if you will, and a river on one side. You've got an ocean on the other side. And if you were to go to the top of the Dead Sea and hang a left, you'll run into Jerusalem. And then up around Galilee, you're going to have Nain, you're going to have Nazareth, you're going to have Capernaum. And you can kind of think in terms of that. In other words, you can often find the key cities by finding the bodies of water. And then connect them up that way. So, what I want you to see is where Ephraim is. This is the tribal allotment of Ephraim. So that's where Micah is in our story. So you see the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea over there in the bottom right hand corner. Maybe I can help you in perspective wise as we walk through this story. So the text says, in, back in chapter 17 verse 3, he returned some money he stole to his mother. All right, so it's really interesting, like the author of Judges picked out this story, and his story begins with him coming back and saying, Mom, I stole 1,100 pieces of silver from you. Some think it may have been a dowry, don't know exactly what it was. I can't find an exact modern equivalent, but it's a pretty good chunk of change. Abraham bought the cave of Machpelah for about 400. This is 1,100. 1,100 is what they paid Delilah to betray Samson. It's a pretty good chunk of change. And so he stole it from his mother, and so he is bringing it back saying, Mom, I stole all your money. I emptied your bank account. So let's start. the story starts with a son stealing from his mother. Now, I'm glad that he brought it back. I'm glad he told his mom. But there's a problem for me with the fact he stole from her in the first place. Now, if we continue in the story, notice that the, what does the mother say? Let me get you on the same page I am. What does the mother say that she's going to do with it? Okay, she's going to give it to the Lord, but what's her concept of giving it to the Lord? Okay, make an image. Okay, the fact that she is going to honor the Lord with her, she's going to take the money her son stole, and she's going to use it to make an idol. What does that tell us about their understanding of God? Do they have an awareness? We call it the Ten Commandments. I tend to call them the Ten Wedding Vows, because you've got the marriage between God and Israel, and those are the vows at the wedding. So did, were they very aware of those? Okay, if they know God's law very well, they know you don't make any image. Okay, so God's like, the way you honor me is not by making a statue. So you've got 
throughout this story a lot of religious talk, but you don't have truth. It's possible to talk about religious and spiritual things and not have God's truth and not be doing what God's asked for. So the mother decides that she is going to use that to build a shrine. So in verse 5, Micah had a shrine and he made an ephod and household idols and consecrated one of his sons that he might become his priest. All right, so he makes a place of worship. He has an ephod just like Aaron is going to have a special breastplate that he's going to use in honoring God. Micah makes his own. And he appoints his own priest, one of the boys in his family. So his son becomes his priest. And that priest is going to oversee his house of worship, his temple, where he set up his gods that the family is going to worship. And all this is financed by money that he stole from his mother. So, have we found a hero yet? Hey, there's, there's no spiritual hero in the story yet. If we move to verse 7. Now, there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. And what he's going to do is he's going to travel from Bethlehem to Ephraim. So in this particular map, it shows you where Bethlehem is down below Jerusalem. It's just a couple miles south of Jerusalem. And where the region of Ephraim is. So it's going to be, just to give you an idea, he's traveling north, slightly northwest. And what he's doing is he is looking for work. He is traveling looking for work. I don't know what your experience is growing up. Once upon a time, I preached in Mississippi, and there were a lot of people living around Hatley, Mississippi, who had moved up north, in particular had taken jobs with a lot of the car factories and stuff up around Detroit because they couldn't find work. And so they traveled up north to get work, and then they retired back around Hatley where they had grown up. This is a guy traveling north looking for work. The Levites didn't have their own section of country like the other tribes. Okay, You had an allotment here for this tribe, allotment here for this tribe. The Levites are scattered among the tribes. And so they had individualized cities, and then they worked within the other tribes. They were the spiritual guides, preachers, teachers, etc. within all the other tribes. So you've got a man who's supposed to be, he's from a tribe that's supposed to focus on spiritual things and God and worship and teaching about God, and he's traveling looking for a job. Now it's important in the story, where is he from? Did that pop up? That's a really big deal. The last two stories in the book focus on events that happened in the book of Bethlehem or in the city of Bethlehem. And I'll come back in a moment or at the very end and try to, to re-emphasize that. He is from Bethlehem. I think we all, maybe, I don't know. I don't know everybody's background. Do we know any important events from Bethlehem? Anybody else from Bethlehem that we know? Okay. David's got connections there. Jesus was born there. So it's a very significant city in the Bible. It's also significant in relation to two books in the Old Testament in particular that I'm thinking about tonight, though it's, it's important to others. So he comes from Bethlehem, and what he says is, I am here looking for a job. And so what Micah says, look in verse 10, Dwell with me, be a father and a priest to me, and I'll pay you a salary. Okay, I'll give you a yearly salary, I'll give you clothing to wear, and I'll give you what we would call today three squares a day. Okay, I'll give you three meals a day. If you'll just come, because who has been his priest up to this point? His son, who's not of priestly descent. So who happens to show up at his front door looking for a job? A Levite, a man from the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe. Hey, I can actually have a priest that is legitimately from the right tribe. But what is the problem? He's going to be a priest to what? To idols. Okay? So you've got a little bit of following God and a whole lot of not. Notice what Micah says after he hires him. What is his statement?
Now I know that the Lord will prosper me because I've got a Levite for my priest. Okay, everything's going to be great now. I hired a preacher who has a degree from the right university. So everything's going to be great. But there's a major problem. He may have the pedigree, he may have pedigree, he may have the degree on the wall, but he's still a priest to idols and not the one true God. So again, I ask the question, have they found a hero yet? If we jump to chapter 18, notice the phrase in chapter 18, verse 1. In those days there was what? No king in Israel. Just notice how that just keeps popping up all through the text. In those days, the tribe of the Danites was seeking an inheritance. All right, so it's important to kind of help picture this. Here is the tribal allotment for the tribe of Dan. So to put all our key things in perspective, you've got Bethlehem, which is where the priest is from. Did it, get, it gave the name of Micah. Micah's from, this is, he's from Ephraim. You've got the Levite from Bethlehem. The, the allotment for the tribe of Dan is here. Now, does it give you the name of the priest? Not yet. The author does a big reveal at the end, so I hope we have time to kind of talk about that a little bit. But what I want you to think about is their allotment is that little green shoe-shaped thing there. And the text says they had not been allotted. Really the idea is they had not fully taken possession of it. Also, I want you to notice what it is close to. Do you all see the cities in the circle there? Anybody recognize any of those cities? What people group? There were five city-states that worked together as a unit. And they were known as the Philistines. All right, so their allotment was right next door to the Philistines. So what plays out, like what's going to happen next, likely goes back to the fact that they're not terribly excited about having to take their inheritance away from the Philistines. So in chapter 18, verse 2, it says, The sons of Dan sent out messengers to spy out the land. They want to find a better place to live. They have an allotment, but they haven't possessed it, and they don't particularly want to stay there. And so they came to the hill country of Ephraim and to the house of Micah. So they're on their way. They're, think about how Moses sent out the 12 spies before they went into the promised land. They're sending out spies. Go look for a better place for us to live. So as they're traveling, they're working their way northeast. So they're going, you can see here, from Zora. And what section do they go through if they travel northeast from Zora? They go through the country of Ephraim. And so as they're traveling along, hey, there's a house. All right, so let's stop in and see if we can get something to eat. So if you look in verse 3, when they were near the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young man. Now this probably doesn't mean they were like close neighbors and so they knew the sound of his voice and that kind of stuff. It probably means as they're traveling, they heard him talking and he had a unique brogue, which meant he was not from around here. Do you think I'll ever be confused for being from Boston? It'll never, ever happen. I remember one time a friend of mine who is from Mississippi, we were walking across the plaza in Washington, D.C., in between State House and the Lincoln Memorial. So we're just walking across, two friends talking. There's people everywhere. You know, we're not paying any attention to anyone else. There's a man walking along beside us. And so it turns out he was walking with us all the way across the plaza to a museum or something we were going to. We get to the other side, and he said, I just have to ask. Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee, which one are you from? And I thought that was fascinating because, I mean, if you go to Washington, D.C., the whole world, there's somebody from every planet there. 
okay? Every country, every, whatever you can imagine. The, his point was, you have to be from the South. So that's likely what's going on here. They said, hey, there's somebody here who's not from around here, and that starts a conversation. Now, as they begin to talk, they, he, they find out that he's a priest. Oh, great, we've got a priest. Maybe he can talk to God and let us know what we should do. And so he tells his story, tells them how he has become a priest for Micah. They said in verse 5, inquire of the Lord. In verse 6, the priest said to them, go in peace. Your way in which you are going has the Lord's approval. I have no idea if he actually had any inclination of what the Lord wanted. But he seems to have told them what they needed to hear. So let me quickly overview what happens in the next part of the story. What they do is they're going to keep traveling northward, and they're going to go up above the Sea of Galilee, and they're going to end up into, at, at, at the city of Laish. And I had the opportunity several years ago, when I finished my undergrad, I went and lived in Israel for the summer, and so I remember visiting the ancient city of Laish, which ended up having, because of this story, ended up having the name of Dan. So if I can see on the map over here on the left, this purple line here going up is showing you the route. It was a hundred miles from here up to here. So they're walking, these spies, they travel a hundred miles north, north of the Sea of Galilee. Here's where they came from, the tribal allotment of Dan, right above it is Ephraim. And then way up here is Laish, which would come to be known as Dan. And so in Judges chapter 20 and verse 1, you have a key phrase that's found in the Old Testament. It talks about the sons of Israel from what to what? From Dan to Beersheba. Now when they went up there, the Israelites did not control Laish, or what came to be known as Dan. But after they invade the city, Israel has possession of it, and so the, the southern border was Dan, or the northern border was Dan, the southern border was Beersheba. So the spies are going to go there, and they're going to find a peaceful people and an attractive land. Okay, they don't have an alliance with any powerful city-state. They don't seem to have, have, like for example, I do a lot of mission work in Panama. Panama doesn't have a standing army. Okay, part of the agreement on the canal is we have to defend the canal. I'm not, they have a police force, but if Panama is ever invaded, U.S. soldiers have to come and defend it. They don't have their own standing army. And so Laish was a peaceful people, and they had been able to be at peace and survive because they, they were out in the middle of nowhere until the spies from Dan found them. And so if you look at verse 30, the sons of Dan set up for themselves a graven image uh, let me back up. Let me give you just a summary of what all happens next. They're going to go up to Laish, and they're going to find a peaceful, peaceful people. They're going to come back and say, hey, we found this amazing, beautiful, wonderful city, and they don't have a way of defending themselves. They're going to send 600 soldiers back up there, and they're going to end up taking that city. The problem is, as they're on their way, they are going to stop at the home of Micah. And what are they going to do? Because remember, they've already traveled by and met Micah's priest. So, what have they done? They stole his priest, and they stole his main idol. They are literally fighting over idols. And so they are going to take it for themselves, and they are going to set up a graven image. They took over his priest and his false worship and made it theirs, and they moved it up to Laish, the city they had just conquered and taken from a peaceful people. Do you see any spiritual heroes in this story? Can you see why maybe the author of the book of Judges might have chosen this story? Just share with me, what are some evidences you see in this story of how bad things were in Israel?
What'd you say? Okay. They got a problem with the priesthood and leadership. Because the same, one of the things y'all want you to challenge you to think about is you're studying any book in the Bible. Why did this author tell this story? Because every author could pick many stories. In fact, John, at the end of John, said there are many other which could have been written. In fact, he would say with their writing abilities that day, if we wrote down everything Jesus did, with our capabilities of writing what he's basically saying, we couldn't get it all in the book. So all four of the gospel writers have to pick out the stories that they think are most important to tell what they need to tell about Jesus to that audience. And so it seems to me the writer of the book of Judges said, how do I illustrate what it looks like when a country walks away from God and does what's right in their own eyes? And he picks this story to tell that. And I think as we think about a so what from the story, I think it reminds us that worship without truth leads to idolatry, immorality, and hypocrisy. I want you to think about as you look at this particular story. They thought they were worshiping God. Micah thought that God was going to be pleased because he hired a priest legitimately from the tribe of Levi to lead worship to this idol. They used holy items. They used a a place of worship. They had a temple, a shrine. They had an ephod. They're mimicking what God wanted, but they're not doing what God wanted. In spite of all of these religious things, they practiced immorality in violation of God's will, and they practiced idolatry in violation of God's will. I am reminded of what is in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7, holding a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. They knew some things about God, said Paul, but they didn't fully know truth and they didn't live it out in their lives. In John chapter 5, Jesus said, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life. It is possible to know some things about God and not be right with God, and not actually listen to and fully follow what we have been exposed to. The second thing is that a holy people without holy leadership becomes an unholy people. I want you to think about the leadership in the story. A mother leads her son in idolatry. That son then leads Micah's family in idolatry. The leaders of the tribe of Dan lead the whole tribe in idolatry. A Levite sells out his services to the highest bidder And can we do that as preachers and youth ministers and church leaders? We can make job choices based on a paycheck, ignoring what Scripture teaches or what God wants. He sold out to the highest bidder. And then you have a Levite that leads a family and then a whole tribe into idolatry. Let me come back full circle to Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, it says, Since that time, no prophet has risen like Moses. I made the comment earlier that if you wanted to ask a first century Christian or a first century Jew, who are their heroes of faith? They're going to mention Moses, Abraham, and David. I don't know. I would be interested in what your Bible says. But in the New American Standard, it says, it finally, in verse 30, tells us the name of of the priest that was hired by Micah and stolen by the tribe of Dan. And it says his name is Jonathan. It's kind of like at the end, we're going to tell who this guy is. But then I want you to notice what it says about him. The New American Standard said he's the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh. What does your translation say? Son of Moses. Most translations have here, son of Moses. If you were to look at the family lineage 
of Moses, if you would look in Exodus chapter 2 in particular, okay, Gershom is son of Moses. You have some ancient documents that have Manasseh. You also have some, actually more ancient documents that have Moses here. Now, I don't want to belabor or overemphasize the point, but one of the things you have to wrestle with when you have ancient copies of Scripture that have two different readings, you've got to figure out which one makes the most sense. All right, so if this is Moses, then Jonathan, and now if you go to Exodus 2, Moses is from the tribe of Levi. Okay? If the reading is Moses, then what's the implication here? You've got a grandson or a great-grandson of one of their national heroes who helped lead an entire tribe into idolatry. So, if the original reading, when the author of Judges first wrote it down, was Manasseh, would it make a lot of sense for them to say, huh, let's make him the son of a national hero, let's change it to Moses? Or would it make more sense if the original reading was Moses, and they said, oh, wow. Oh, wow. That means that he's the grandson or great-grandson of the great prophet and leader Moses. And actually, if you look in the original Hebrew, Moses and Manasseh are really, really really close in spelling. They look more different in English than they would in the original language. So you may say, what difference does it make? It could be one more illustration of how far they fell. That you go from Deuteronomy chapter 34, there's not one like Moses. You begin the book of Judges with Caleb, a man of faith and courage and righteousness. And you end the book with a grandson or a great-grandson of Moses who sold his spiritual leadership to the highest bidder, who sold out his family, who sold out a tribe. That it would then become just one more illustration of what it looks like when a nation doesn't listen to God. But don't let me leave you with despair. If you go to the book of Judges, the book of Judges, I mean, book of Ruth, what does it focus on? Anybody know what? Where, where does the story in Ruth take place? In Bethlehem. The last two stories in Judges tell about Bethlehem's story. The story in the book of Ruth tells a Bethlehem story. The book begins in the Hebrew with what is called a Vav consecutive, which is what is often used to begin a story by saying, and something happened, and it was used many times to say what happened is a continuation of something that has happened previously. In other words, Ruth is connected to Judges. It is the continuation of Judges. It is the third story from Bethlehem. Except in the book of Ruth, how does the story of Bethlehem end? Ruth marries, and they have a child, and who is a descendant of that child? David. And the book begins by saying, in 
the days of the judges. In the midst of the awfulness that was happening in Judges, God plants a seed that becomes a godly leader. God is going to raise up a hero. So, you've spent all summer talking about idols. How are we going to keep our families, our communities, and our churches from idols. Godly leaders stepping up, taking a stand, being an example, doing the right thing. Just like in the days of Judges, God's people need spiritual heroes. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and grace. Be with us as we travel to our homes. Father, help us to do what is right in your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.